Welcome to another episode of the Alpha Mind Podcast, where we have amazing conversations with outstanding people from the world of trading and investing. Our guests include traders, analysts, trading and investing psychologists and coaches, writers, and an array of experts on all things trading. What we really want to get to on this podcast is clear answers to the question, what leads to great trading performance? Over the past couple of years, we have chatted with numerous guests about the things they have learnt on their own personal journeys through the markets. In this podcast, myself, Stephen Goldstein, and my co-host, Mark Randall, ask the questions, have the conversations, and go to places so that you can learn from others and challenge yourself to improve and get better. In today's episode, myself and my co-host, Mark Randall, explore and discuss three guiding principles which we feel are essential for building a strong platform for a successful trading practice and are principles which also apply in other areas of life and business as well. So they are, in a sense, universal principles. Here are a few excerpts from this episode. He was building business based upon this model of trust, all linked to his purpose. But it wasn't about, it didn't start off with making money. It started off with identifying that purpose. I was there myself as a trader where I hated myself. I used to beat myself up. And which trader out there listening to this hasn't beat themselves up at times? You know, hasn't considered themselves their own worst enemy? Hasn't been through that gut-wrenching hell as a trader? And, and, and I had it, you know, I, I, I had several periods in my life. And, you know, as a trader, you know, overall I had a great trading career. But it is a roller coaster. It's an emotional roller coaster. You know, it, it, it rips your stomach out at times. It's gut-wrenching experiences. Sometimes it's on a daily basis i'm almost welling up talking about it or thinking about it i was just digging my heels in further and further you know i was saying things like the market is wrong i'm not wrong classic classic line if you ever hear yourself saying it the market is never wrong okay the market just is and you need to recognize that Before we go into this podcast, a reminder that a big part of our work here at Alpha Mind is about helping people to become better, more effective at their work to help them answer that question, what leads to great trading performance? And in a sense, this podcast is an extension of the work myself and Mark do both individually and collectively. And we get asked often about our services. If you are interested about knowing more about what we do, how we can help you, whether you're an individual trader, whether you're a trader working in a business on on either the sell side or the buy side, or, or whether you're a business who wants to help improve the quality of the trading performance of the people within your business and the business performance of the trading business, that is where we specialize. We we are coaches. We are qualified coaches. Uh, We have a method and an approach which works with people and has worked with people over many years, helping them to develop their performance, to develop how they turn up into their job, how they bring the best of themselves, how they deal with that element, the non-technical aspect of trading, which is such a key part of trading performance. And as we always emphasize, trading is a performance activity. You know, there's many technical aspects about it, but the technical aspects alone don't deliver great trading performance. They must be allied to the human aspects, the self aspects the behavioural aspects, the performance aspects. And that's where our coaching programmes go. So if you're you're interested about learning more about what we do, go on to our blog page, Alpha Mind blog. You can see quite a lot of details there in the links about the programmes we run or email us directly, info at alpha-mind.net. And we would be delighted to have a conversation with you and tell you more about our work. In the meantime, a few words about our podcast sponsor, the Society of Technical Analysts, the STA. The big part of what we do is about arming people to be at their very best. And a big part of being at your very best is having the best tools, the best training and the best education possible. That is why we partner with the Society of Technical Analysts, the STA, as our sponsorship partner. The quality of your output will be determined to a large part on the quality of your input. The STA are one of the world's leading providers of education in technical analysis. It is one thing to learn technical analysis from a five minute YouTube video, but it's quite another to study technical analysis on an STA program created by some of the leading people globally within their field. If you are serious about becoming a serious trader, then learning technical analysis properly should be something you should consider. This is why we highly recommend looking into the STA Technical Analysis Home Study course, which is an online version of the course which supports their diploma program that is delivered at the world-renowned London School of Economics. Alpha Mind podcast listeners can get a discount to this course by visiting 
visiting our Alphamai blog page. That's alphamyblog.blogspot.com. Or just Google Alphamai blog and go to the page link STA Home Study Course. We do hope you enjoy today's outstanding chat. If you would like to leave a rating or review at the end of this podcast, then this would be gratefully received. Now, on with this week's podcast. Okay, so welcome to this week's Alpha Mind podcast with uh, myself and Mark Randall. And um, this this week, we're just, it's, it's myself and Mark. We're just going to have a quick chat about, um, really, the issue of guiding principles for trading, business, and life in general. That is what we're going to talk about today. This is our summer August special podcast. We will be back next month with some special guests for you, including the trading psychology legend, Dr. Van Gaithart. Um, And I promise you that's a great episode. It's already been recorded. And um, it's one that you'll want to listen to time and time again. And we have another great episode already recorded with Brent Donnelly, author of a fantastic new book called Alpha Trader, which I highly recommend. And we had a great chat about that. And some of my hedge fund clients have already said to me, Steve, this is the best book written about trading for many years. It's up there with Market Wizards and Reminiscences of a Stock Operator. And we've had a great interview and a great chat with him about Alpha Trader. So you have those two podcasts to look forward to next month. In the meantime, it's myself and Mark talking about this very topic. Hello, Mark. Hey, Steve. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm absolutely, absolutely fine. Thank you. And uh, today we're going to talk about guiding principles for trading business and life. And you're going to kick us off. Yeah, I think it's got to start with one word, really. And that's fragile. Understanding that we are all actually really, really fragile. And we're all actually sensitive to stuff. And our ability to actually perform is really dependent upon actually what we're putting around us to make us more resilient to the difficult things of trading, difficult things of life. And if we start off knowing that we're fragile, we start to understand that we need to do something about building a shell around us that is our supporting structure to to be able to push away difficulties, to move through challenges, but also to be able to walk towards the things with, with, with more confidence. Um, but we have to start off with, with that understanding that, you know, we are always at some degree of risk uh, as an individual level um, and that things can hurt us and get us to the core if we're not careful. If, we're, if we don't know how to deal with stuff, we can be taken off the tracks pretty easily. We can be taken from high performance to no performance within a second if we become vulnerable to the things that get through to our fragility. So it's about building the shell around us of of being able to deal with crap without that crap interfering with us. Because if if we don't deal with it, it can get to us, the very core of us, and just disrupt everything that we do. How we show up for life, how we show up for our mates, how it stops us wanting to go out because we're just bothered by something because we've allowed it to impact us because we've not done anything to really give us some degree of protection for all the crap that life and trading can throw at us that gets through to that fragility. So we're all really, really vulnerable. And so we all must carefully think about how do I make myself less vulnerable? How do I make myself more bulletproof to the stuff that goes on so I can respond better, so I can get through it? better so i can you know have the clarity of mind to see opportunity when all around me is going into chaos so it has to start with fragility you're on a subject very dear to my heart and as you know i'm a huge fan of the work of nassim taleb and um you can see sitting over my right shoulder on the video you can see of me right now mark is his book fooled by randomness which has pride of place on my shelf i also have his book anti-fragile up there somewhere as well um and the whole concept of anti-fragile he says that anti-fragile systems and anti-fragile people are not strong but they're systems which are durable you know that they, they have anti-fragility built into them that, that they and he gives the example in the book of a washing machine when it spins the whole thing starts moving and jumping 
and things fall it off it fall off it because it is almost too rigid for its purpose and the makers of it build lots of elements within it springs and components and cement blocks that hold it in place but to make it a more anti-fragile structure a little bit like and he talks about buildings as well you know in earthquake zones the buildings are built to be able to, I think in Japan, to be able to withstand the sort of earthquake that has never actually happened yet. They're built so the buildings can wobble and move and that the structure doesn't break. So they're built in with anti-fragility. What happens though with people, and we try and make out that we're strong, that we're not going to get hurt. Mm -hmm. It's why we don't talk about, or people don't like talking about their emotions because they don't want to present themselves supposedly as weak to the outside world when actually the people that do talk about their emotions the people that are more open are actually stronger people no, so, i mean with some of the big corporate clients i, I deal with the, their, their biggest challenge is getting across the you need to manage your mental health uh profile and, and, and your condition to men they can get they get it across to women Women seem to have a, a greater concept of emotional intelligence and self-compassion to be bothered to commit to a program of, of yoga or mindfulness or, or whatever, right? That they, they see women turn up and women talk to each other about their fragility, you know, to come with me and to these sessions to, to, to try to build a more resilient me and to, you know, to, to, to thrive in a different way. That conversation goes on with women. It doesn't go on with men. Um, and we know that uh, John McCaskill, one of our, our, our Navy SEAL commander, as you know, men talking mindfulness as a as a great uh, piece of work out there as a podcast, because you know he gets it as well that men do need to talk more about these things. They need to to have this self compassion of realizing that, yeah, well. You know, you're you're not as bulletproof as you think, mate. You know, you need to take on board that you are vulnerable, that you are fragile, and you need to be able to have a mechanism to cope with adversity, to have this grit that gets you through difficulty. Because if you don't have any of that, then these things get through to your inner self and start to disrupt your function. Um, And if you don't build that toolkit around managing your function, then you're vulnerable to these, these these different types of bullets, as, 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 as if you call them bullets, coming at you. Well, we, we, we're, you know, we're, we're talking about trading and we're talking about business. We're talking about life. They all mesh into one. A trader is an individual business. Yeah, let's look at the person. And what goes on in his life is what he's doing in his trading. Correct. You know, when I coach people, and I've had some examples of, People and actually, in our next podcast coming up, um, Van Tharp talked about an example of when he's worked with doctors who have become traders and gone on to his super trading program. And then they discovered that they're the, the reason they wanted to be a trader is they got fed up with life being a doctor, but actually, they got fed up with life. Mm-hmm. And he helped them rediscover their passion for life. And many of them went, or at least the, I think in the example he gave. If I remember, this individual went back to being a doctor because he rediscovered his passion there. Now, I've done work with traders who have left their business or it's actually it's not true they've left their business. They've been doing another business. I've had at least two examples of people involved in sales roles where I'm coaching them. They come to me because they want to improve their trading. In both cases, <laughs> they actually stop the coaching before the end of the program. Because they said, I've actually decided not to be a trader. And I said, why is that? I said, my sales is going so much better. And what actually happened was I'd helped them rediscover something that was missing in themselves, that they then started working better as a salesperson, and they started getting much better results. And they decided that was where they were going to put their energy now, because they were making more. In fact, they needed to put their energy there because they were getting more business. Yeah, I mean, that's, I go deeper, as, as you know, from the stuff I do to, to to the very sort of inner workings of just how people function. And I don't care really if they're a trader, a sales guy, an executive, or just a, 
just a normal sort of bloke. I think we all have the ability to be genius. We all have we all have the right to have a purpose and to find that purpose and find out that there's a bigger purpose to us. And it might just be that we're, we're having this, you know, we're doing this stuff called trading, but it's, you know, it's, it's perhaps it's a, a glorified hobby. But actually to, to get this in level of enlightenment where you start to feel as though you're on a, a, a life journey could well sort out your, 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 your own trading direction. Because if you're comfortable with yourself and you know your purpose, the direction you move in in, and it may, have, it, may, it may have nothing at all to do with the markets. But I, but if you find that and you still have that thing driving your journey in life, guess what? You'll be a better trader. You'll be a better salesperson for knowing that you have that background purpose driving you. And it, it guess will help. And you notice it in people in general. You'll notice people that talk of a bigger plan, of a bigger purpose and their position in a, in a bigger model that's going on, they come across very, very differently. They come across karma. They tend to come across in a more positive, more engaging sort of way. They come across as, across as bigger thinkers. They, they come across as people able to cope with things that get thrown at them more readily. And if you look at those qualities and say, well, actually, they're the sort of qualities you need in trading. So, so from this kind of first guiding principle of of fragility that we, we are all fragile whatever we do it, it's almost recognizing that fragility yeah well yeah i guess well, knowing that it's a risk for all of us so what are we doing to manage that risk but you've moved on from beautifully from this guiding principle of fragility to this other guiding principle whether it's connected to it directly or indirectly of purpose what is your purpose yeah. which is in other words guiding principle number one recognize you're fragile guiding principle number two know your purpose yeah. and work yeah. with that and and i I, you know, I talk about this so often with traders and, and managers in businesses it tell me that my goal is this and i say okay but what is your purpose and, and it, it, they suddenly go deep into this conversation and is that goal aligned to the purpose? Now, I, I often find a lot of problems and that people set themselves goals which just have no connection to their purpose. In fact, there's like a, a mission drift, you know, that they get too far away from their purpose. They're, in other words, their original purpose was to get into trading, to try and become successful at trading and to try and build a career where they could earn an income and hopefully much more than an income from trading and, and get wealthy from it. But a purpose starts with, how do I do this? Then you get this mission creep comes in, which is, how do I make money? What do I need to do to make money? And then I want to make this much money. And they set themselves a goal, which is often unrealistic, of making X money. And you make that by being right. And they suddenly got a new purpose, which is to be right which is not the right purpose. I don't think it's a purpose at all. It's not a purpose, no, but it, 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 it takes over. So you've now got, I, I need to be right, which isn't what trading is. Trading is monetizing opportunities when it comes along and managing risk and creating a whole process around that, which allows you to generate an income. It's not about being right. The best traders are wrong more than they're right. Yeah, that, that's not a purpose. If you look at not, a noble purpose is not make, about making money. It's not about, that's not a noble purpose. There's a, there's, there's a bigger, that's just the goal. You want a bigger purpose than that. But the question is, why do you want to make money? Yeah, I want to create a safe future. I want to create financial stability. I want to have maybe, which I want to give my children what I didn't have maybe because we didn't grow up in a wealthy environment. But it is a chance for me to do that. You know, lots of different reasons, but there has to be a reason. It's not – whenever it becomes money just for money's sake, I always find that their purpose uh, – Well, it's, it's not a purpose. I'd say that's just not a purpose at all. A purpose is finding an absolute direction for your life, and that might be supporting people, about giving back, about helping, about community stuff. 
a big, a big guy in New York City I knew that was that built his own $2 billion hedge fund. He built that because he had a purpose. His purpose wasn't making money. His purpose was helping the community in New York City. And he, he built his, his um, hedge fund through the network of other people in the business that also had a shared purpose with him to support the community. And ironically, some of those people became his clients within the hedge fund because they were financiers as well. And that they worked out that their purpose was giving back and supporting. And they, they slept one night a week at their soup kitchen and they helped out. And his purpose was to give back and to help others that were far, far, far less well off by, you know, they were at the bottom of the, the pile. So there was a higher purpose there. So, yeah, a noble purpose, a noble purpose. So he, he discovered his noble purpose. So he then had a therapy dog. So he, he had a dog that was then trained that he would take to old people's homes and they would just have this this dog on, on their laps to just, you know, to be part of their therapy. And he'd travel all over America with a passport for his dog as a therapy dog to go and help other people. So his reputation in markets had nothing to do about markets. It had the fact that he'd found this noble purpose, stuck with it, and carried other people with him. And those other people were often from, you know, the JPs and the Goldmans and, and Greenwich when we were at Greenwich at the time. They were embracing this and, and, and joining his purpose. But they would be also, from a transactional point of view, they'd built this different type of trust because they shared this purpose. And so he was building business based upon this model of trust, all linked to his purpose. But it wasn't about, it didn't start off with making money. It started off with identifying that purpose. You, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I, I don't think we often start with a purpose, but we might even feel it. You know, when I started in trading, I, I was attracted to it because you know, there was a lot of guys earning a lot more money who were all doing it, who were all young, you know, and I, and I, I knew a lot of them. And it, it seemed exciting and interesting as well. So I, I, you know, I found my way to a job in the city because it was far more interesting than what I was doing at that point. I, I, I didn't really have a purpose that I could clarify. But in a way, I did. It was I wanted to get involved in this exciting world where there was a possibility to earn a good income and create a life for myself. That, I wouldn't have been able to consciously say at that time. You know, it might have been, this just looks interesting and has got, you can earn a lot of money doing it. And that took me into it. And then that kind of purpose, which I didn't know inspired me, and it, it, it kept me going for quite a few years. And then what's interesting is, as, you know, as you were talking there, I was suddenly became aware of purpose drift. I, Mid-career, my purpose started to shift. Um, and it, and it, my purpose became from being not positive to a negative purpose in that my purpose became to survive. Mm. And that's not a good purpose. It's a demotivating purpose. That The first purpose is motivational. When you talked about a higher need that, for that individual, okay, that, that was a motivating purpose. I didn't have that, but I had one for myself that I hoped I could build a family upon. You know, and I, I didn't come from a wealthy background. I came from, you know, my parents were working class. We never had much money growing up. So I, I had a, a good purpose in the sense that I wanted to move out of that and beyond that, as a lot of my friends did as well. And, it, you know, that motivated me to get into this job. You know, I hadn't been to university or, you know, I didn't have those opportunities. Somewhere around about mid-career in my 30s, I started to lose sight of that purpose. And I started to become, you know, I'd done well, and now I wanted to hold on. And that, in a sense, became my purpose. And that wasn't a very motivating purpose. So you've always got to be aware of what your purpose was. And it was only later in my career when I, read, I suppose, in a sense, I rediscovered my purpose and suddenly started feeling... Um, driven by it again and motivated by it. I, I don't know if you understand what I'm saying there, Mark, but purpose isn't always clear, but you have to align your goals to your purpose, whatever it is. I think yeah, understanding purpose first and then aligning goals to it is probably a, a good strategy. And sometimes they are divergent and 
life isn't a straight line, so you're going to have, you know, some periods of of down. And back in the 80s and 90s, when we were experiencing <clears throat> that fluctuation, um, you know, we didn't have there was this this topic wasn't a discussion out there. I'd found my own pathway through absolute sheer luck. Um, and having a, an arthritic condition I needed to manage and it got me into discussions in the in the 80s that suddenly gave me a, a pathway that gave me a better chance of finding purpose and also better, getting a better chance of dealing with negativity that turned up in, in that journey that was going to be ahead of me. Um, and that made me more robust to be able to deal with it. But actually, I wrote some things down in this, this little book that's... Uh, that's uh, actually right in front of me here uh -huh. in this little book. Your little yellow book. My little yellow book. Back in 1993, I described a vision for my purpose, which I look back now and it's pretty blooming close to where I've ended up in terms of this, this space that I'm in now, which is – you know, whatever you want to, coaching, mentoring people. I've got this mindfulness angle. I've got this corporate mind fitness angle. I've, I'm in, um, integrating myself with one of the biggest mindfulness apps in the world because they need corporate support. And it's and I identified this niche in around about 1993 because maybe in 1993 I had the early foundation skills to be able to you know, deal with the lumps and bumps of life and open up a different level of of enlighten, enlightenment to what was possible. And I described it in 1993. But, you know, between 1993 and now, an awful lot went on. But maybe it was an easier journey for me because I had I was I was always understanding that I had this, I described my purpose early on. And so everything was kind of going that way. And actually, when I started to recodify some of the, the mindfulness stuff in the business I worked in, it was starting to come together much more rapidly as me, you know, finding out what that purpose was. And I remember being on an osteopath's table in the early 90s as well and getting shoved around and pushed around. And you tend to have these conversations with these osteopaths. And this fella became ultimately the osteopath for the royal family and was ironically a neighbour of mine, and I didn't know about it, in, in the early 80s. Um, we just never crossed paths. But I remember talking to him, and he says, Mark, you know, you've got just got this method of, of conversation that, you know, you should be some sort of counsellor because you know how to engage with people. And, and, and I guess sort of almost shrugged it off back in the early 90s because I was a futures broker, and that's, that's kind of what I was. But actually, looking back, I know exactly what it now means because actually, it is about having a tone and a pace of conversation and a and a, a method of listening and a method of engagement. Sort of sums up what what we're now doing now, right? It's a, how how do you get people to reveal, you know, the stuff that perhaps they've not revealed before that they need to pay more attention to, particularly men. Like I say. Women tend to reveal these things far easier than men. And if we go back to the frag fragility thing, it's that men just think they're bulletproof and guess cope. Actually, well, the real life story isn't that at all. And that men are finding huge difficulty in coping with, with all sorts of things. And so pu purpose is important to understand where you get your direction from, to feel that you've got some clarity to cope with it. And that's what I found personally. And I convey that to what close is close on now to 40,000 people that I've shared these experiences with. And I get the feedback from them that they too have found, you know, direction from the purpose, direction from understanding and doing something about their fragility and actually moving on from there to actually ju just being better people. You know, just being the person that helps somebody that perhaps they wouldn't have helped before. You know, the person that doesn't necessarily... Uh, ignore somebody else's pain and doesn't want to get involved in helping to support them, but is happy to tap somebody on the shoulder in the office and say, are you okay? You know, can I help? And, that, and that's what this stuff leads to. And it gets back to being, being human and a sense of humanity. 
you know, this is, you know, big, big picture stuff. And it goes beyond the job. It goes beyond the task. It goes into about how you live your life at a big picture level. And it's a combination of understanding this, you know, from the fragile beginnings to the, the various things, that the knocks and bumps that, that get in the way, understanding the bigger purpose, understanding how the purpose drives what you do in terms of your goals, you know, during, during the performance part of your life, when it's the earning period of your life. But, of course, you've, you, you've got to then be setting yourself up for well, what's next in my journey. You know, what am I moving on to here? You know, I can't, I, I can't be a, a trader all my life because I'm going to end up, in the way we trade nowadays, just staring at a screen 10 hours a day, wondering about the stuff I can't see that's a trading opportunity. There's a bigger thing going on. Just coming in very quickly to remind our listeners that uh, the Alpha Mind podcast is sponsored by the Society of Technical Analysts, the STA. If you're serious about trading and you're serious about developing yourself as a trader, do look into their home study course. It is based on the diploma program which they run at the world-renowned London School of Economics. Uh, you can find out more about it on the Alpha Mind blog. Just Google Alpha Mind blog or go to alphamindblog.blog spot.com and there you can find out how listener to the Alphaman podcast can get a discount on the full cost of this online course thank you and uh, back to the podcast it's interesting because i i i i'm I mean, i'm sort of listening to you there and i think you know this is brilliant stuff um and i'm also wondering you know how someone can apply this to themselves and it's quite easy to apply it in this bigger picture but how do you condense that down to what they're doing on a daily basis? You know, how do they remain, understand this concept of fragility? How can they support themselves to to be more durable whilst almost honouring that fragility rather than pretending that they're not fragile? And I, I think this concept of purpose is part of that. But also, how does that translate to what they're doing on a daily basis, how they turn up at work? You know, if, if each day, I should imagine you turn up and I've got to make X amount of money, I've got to make X amount of money, I've got to make X amount of money, I've got to get this right, I've got to buy this, I've got to sell this. What happens is the goal deviates them from their process. If you have a process aligned to your purpose, and a purpose aligned to your process, you will follow your process and stay with it and accept that not every day is going to be a great day and that you're going to have losses. And it leads to that acceptance, which to me is one of the guiding principles that I think everyone, as, as you know, I'm a big fan of letting go, this concept of letting go. It becomes easier if you stay true to your purpose. It becomes easier if you accept your fragility. You know, and, and, and on a daily basis in your trading, what does that mean? It means I'm going to follow my process and I'm not going to interrupt it. And if it loses money today, so be it. But it's where you try and interrupt the process and stop yourself losing money. Sometimes you end up losing a lot more. Yeah, I think there's something else that, that creeps in here that, that is that I know is the foundation for an awful lot of the um, the military training now, um, and you see it in some of the stuff that's going with Afghanistan at the moment. This concept of compassion, so the concept of self compassion, where we start to understand that it's not just about, for example, me turning up at work and asking Steve Goldstein, "How are you? How are you?" It's about actually me asking me, "How how am I?" Am I okay? I, am I fit to to sit in front of this screen to trade? You know, have I rested well? Have I have I, have I have I cleared my mind before the complexity of a trading day by by going for a walk and in that walk paying attention to the sensation of the walk and tuning into my senses in the air and breathing the air and and, and then making sure I'm hydrated, making sure I'm, I'm eating the right stuff to energize myself for the day. Um, and understanding that the day is not like 6,000 revs for 10 hours a day and uh, you're going to stay do that day after day. You need to break up your day in, in manageable chunks and keep on asking yourself, am I all right? Am, am I fit for the next phase of trading? Because that compassion 
towards yourself is important for you to realize that all of that goes goes back to you don't want your fragility interfered with by suddenly getting into such a state that you start to fall apart. So so compa- compassion is important so that we are constantly asking ourselves, am I okay? And if we don't feel as though we're okay, we need to think about doing something about that to protect ourselves, so that our, our performance isn't, um, you know, reduced by us entering the trading arena and we just don't feel right. I'm going to bring in a couple of examples here because we're getting onto a huge topic that I think we could talk about for the next five years almost. <laughs> so I, I want to try and boil it down to a couple of things, right? Again, this is one thing I tell people so often. Self-compassion is one of the most important things in trading. And I meet an awful lot of people, and I was there myself as a trader, where I hated myself. I used to beat myself up. Now, which trader out there listening to this hasn't beat themselves up at times? You know, hasn't considered themselves their own worst enemy? You know, hasn't been through that gut-wrenching hell? Um, as a trader, and, and I had it, you know, I, I, I had several periods in my life, and you know, as a trader, you know, overall I had a great trading career, but it is a roller coaster. It's an emotional roller coaster. You know, it, it, it rips your stomach out at times. It's gut wrenching experiences. You know, um, sometimes it's on a daily basis. You know, I, I'm, I'm almost welling up talking about it or thinking about it. I go back to a period in the mid-90s where I was just on the wrong side of the market. My Also, I'm going back a long time. Some listeners probably weren't even born then as I'm talking about this. But I I was trading S&P futures way back in the mid-90s. And I was was just completely wrong about the market. And I, I was on a wrong trade and it was going spectacularly against me. And I couldn't see what was probably apparent if I'd have been able to watch myself, you know, that that I was just digging my heels in further and further. You know, I was saying things like the market is wrong. I'm not wrong. Classic, classic line. If you ever hear yourself saying it, the market is never wrong. Okay. The market just is. And you need to recognize that. I couldn't see that at a time. Okay. I was beating myself up. I was in a horrible place. I was going through mental torture at this time. We didn't have mobile phones in those days. I used to have my pager. I could see my prices on a pager. And I would throw this pager across my living room into the wall, hoping it would smash up. (laughs) I might not see the prices ticking higher anymore. Um, And, uh, you know, that's an example of a horrible time. Now, I really should have been exercising self-compassion. And I had done, I would have spotted clearly what was happening to me at that time. And I, you know, I've almost been rescued by great managers or great friends, great colleagues who have kind of, you know, come on, Steve, take me aside. Look, you can't see what you're doing here. You're beating yourself up. It's not beating yourself up is not a healthy, it's never healthy. Being beaten up by someone else is obviously not healthy. So beating yourself up is the same thing. This is why self-compassion is is so important. You know, those people who took me aside showed compassion to me. And I can tell you, it helped me enormously when they did it. But most people listening, they're trading at home on their own. Or even if they're trading in an office, they're trying to hide their pain from others. They're trying to be, they're trying not to show their fragility. I can tell them, everyone can see it. Everyone else in that room can see it in you. The only person who can't is yourself. And I'm sure you recognise times where you've seen it in others and they can't see it. That's what happens to you. And that's when you need to be at your most self-aware. Because at that point, you are fragile. You're at your most suboptimal almost. This is where you go off process. This is where you deviate from your purpose. This is where you need to exercise self-compassion. But you're not aware that you need to exercise self-compassion. So at the most, the point where you need that self-awareness and you need some sort of arm around the shoulder 
is the very moment that you least have it and that you're least likely to get it. Which is why self-aware people have such an edge in trading. And, and that's, uh, just to plug our own work a little bit as coaches, that's what we do. That's what myself, Mark, that's what Alpha Mind do. That's a big part of our work. It's not exclusively that. But people come to me sometimes and say, why should I need coaching, Steve? I know what I'm doing. Of course, you know what you're doing. I don't coach you in trading per se. Mark doesn't coach you in trading per se. We help you with the parts of yourself that underlie your coaching, the parts that you can't see. You know, if you can become more self-aware, if you can develop behaviors and habits, if you can see yourself almost this super skill to see yourself in real time as if somebody else was watching you. Can you imagine how powerful that would be? Can you imagine how much better you would trade? Now, that's not an easy thing. You can't self-teach yourself that. It's virtually impossible. We just don't have that level of self-awareness. When you work with a coach, they can help you develop that. And that is a long process to do. You know, and that's what sports coaches do at the very nub of it. You know, you the sports people know how to hit the ball, do a pass. You know, they, they can do all this stuff in practice. It's trying to do it in real time in the moment when the pressure is on. That's where the greatness in an athlete lies. And that's where the greatness in a trader lies. The important thing, actually, and I, an example of this, this lady that, that I was coaching, in. and uh, she wasn't a fund manager, but she was an, an asset manager within the business with, with a huge portfolio. She came to me to help her cope with a domestic tragedy because that, that was impacting her professional career. She had to have t- time off, obviously, to, to, to initially manage that, but it didn't go away. You know, she, I gave her tools to help her deal with something that was totally unpredictable, that was worse than just losing money. And actually realizing that, you know, compassion to others, of you don't really know their background story, particularly if you work in complex offices. You may see somebody having a, what is a, a horrendous time in the trading room, but actually, it may not be because they're a bad trader. It may be because there's some tragedy unfolding at home, you know, with COVID and all the stuff that's going on. As you you know, Steve, the, you know, it, it's a complex environment out there in the world of COVID, and people are find, finding challenges every day. And if we don't have a method of at least trying to to to, to, to guess. You know, look at ourselves and say, you know, I, I need to manage myself. What can I have on board as a toolkit to help me cope with this amount of stress? Uh, because if I can do that, I can then do my, it's important I do my job as well. I can then, you know, do that job as well as I can do it, given all the pressures that I'm under at home. So I know you talked about trading and the challenges of letting go of trading and dealing with trading, but, you know, from, from the work I've done, you start to realize that, People behind the facade, of, of, of all, we've all got challenges. We've all got things that are difficult. Some things are far, far more tragic than just having a bad trade. Um, and it's how, how we deal with that and get through with that and that, that, that resilience that's needed and that strength, that internal strength that's needed to deal with it that becomes the important feature. Well, that, that story you just shared there, um... Obviously, it's, you know, it's, it, it is a trauma in the literal sense. Um, and this lady has had to deal with it. Obviously, uh, she's got to manage the trauma for the children as well, which adds an extra element. Yeah. You know, one of the things I feel in this job quite often is that we have many traumas. And, and I, I sometimes feel a bit insincere using that word when I compare it to the real trauma of for example, this lady who she's been, who you described, or someone who's been in a war zone, or or someone who's been abused as a child, or neglected, or you know a, a, anything such as that. But trading is a series of traumas that I don't think happens in many other jobs. 
in many other areas where, where we have these mini crises going on. Um, you know, it's interesting. I'm just thinking about the interview we did last year with Dave Tate. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, who was a, a fantastic, just to, if you haven't had a chance to listen to the two interviews we did with Dave, Dave was um, a senior foreign exchange trader at Goldman Sachs. He then went on to become one of the founding portfolio managers at Bluecrest Capital, um, the, the global hedge fund. He then went on to be head of global macro trading at both UBS and Credit Suisse, so to the two Swiss investment bank giants. A phenomenal trader, but also someone with a tragic story behind him. He, he was abused as a child growing up by his father. And at the time we were talking to him, there was a film made about his life. Um, and this, these paradoxes in this shiny, glitzy world as a great, successful trader, and then his life story behind him and the two coming together in, 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 a, in a tragic sense. Uh, and Dave's gone on now to become, uh, he's the CEO of the World Gold Council, by the way. Um, and he's raised millions for children's charities and he's climbed Mount Everest on five separate occasions raising vast sums for children's charity. Um, so it's an incredible story. But one of the things that that was raised in our interview with him was this idea of potentially or possibly markets didn't phase him in the same way it phased other people because he'd faced real trauma early in his life on a dramatic sense and almost had to disassociate himself from those traumas to cope with life. So, and we we spoke about this in the interview that what were traumas for other people weren't traumas for him. They were just that you know he could look at everything dispassionately. It almost prepared himself. You know, it almost made himself in a way anti fragile for the markets. You know, if he lost money, it wasn't the worst thing in the world for him. You know, if he was wrong, it wasn't the worst thing in the world for him. He could disassociate from that easily because they weren't that big in his life. And I've worked with quite a few people who have had their own traumas in life that actually adjust to trading so easily because the many traumas that we feel in trading are really not traumas for them at all. And and maybe I'm going off, off, uh, off piece slightly here. Um, but it, it's this ability to uh, to be, in a way, um, resilient. And most people who haven't had trauma in life, they, they, they can't always cope with these traumas. I know I couldn't as a trader um, or, or I wasn't prepared to. Um, and, and they became big things. Maybe later in my life, I dealt with them a little bit, dealt with them a little bit better. Um, but, you know, just the ego attacks that trading does and brings to you. So you have to create this resilience. You know, you have to develop this resilience. And, you know, when you talk about respecting your fragility and realising it and not trying to hold it back, that is such a powerful principle. When you talk about finding your purpose and aligning who you are and what you do with your purpose, that is so powerful you know, as a, 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 a as a secret source code to being a su successful trader. And then this third one you brought up about being self-compassionate, ex exercising self-compassion, yet another great guiding principle, you know, which if you can bring these three together, they are going to help you get through life. They're going to help you be more successful in business. And they're going to help you as a trader. You know, they're going to help improve your chances of success as a trader. Yeah, so as, uh, perhaps we're starting to draw to the end of this, this, this chat, because we, like you say, whenever we get to talk together, our first ever, I remember our first meeting when I reached out to you about, you know, collaboration, we, we booked an hour for lunch, and I think five hours later we were still talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I want to perhaps end with a phrase, and that is a reflection of something that Dame Judy Dench said in the, uh, the Grand Old Marigold Hotel film. It will be okay in the end, but if it's not okay, it's not the end. It kind of sums up this concept of dealing with stuff. We wind ourselves up with stuff. Uh, so from a personal point of view and that dealing with life's consequences and life's challenges, we'll always maintain a degree of hope that things will get better. 
and you know seek seek advice if you need it. But if you can deal with having a toolkit around you, hope you deal with the fragilities and the complexities that life and trading is going to throw at you. You're going to just have this better resilience, as Steve said. So yeah, James Judy Dench, it will be okay in the end. And if it's not okay, it's not the end. That's brilliant. And I think that's a lovely way to bring this summer episode to a conclusion. We hope you've enjoyed it. As a reminder, the three guiding principles for at least the ones we've covered, I'm sure there's more, for business, life, and of course trading, because most people here are traders, are recognise your fragility, I guess, and accept it. Would you say that's correct, Mark, or how would you phrase that? Absolutely, just knowing that you're fragile. Yeah, yeah, So you, and, and accepting that. You know, it's you're not going to be right every time. It's impossible. We're dealing with near randomness in the markets, you know? <laughs> If you just look at the price action in recent weeks, you know, if, you know, don't fix yourself too much. You know, one of the things I try and guard people against is don't make yourself a perma. That makes you rigid. Don't be a perma bull. Don't be a perma bear. Be a bull when it's the right time to be a bull. Be a bear when it's the right time to be a bear. Or don't be either. Just be someone who trades off what the market is telling them. That's a, that's a nice little segue into trading. The, the next one, of course, the second one is purpose. Uh, and again, how would you sum up purpose, Mark? Noble purpose. Your, your, your true destiny. The reason you're here. And make sure you, you maintain your purpose and that your trading is aligned to your purpose. If you set unrealistic goals which don't marry your purpose, well, I'm sorry, you, you're not going to achieve what you want to achieve. Let your goals come from your purpose. OK, allow your goals to flex with reality, but keep your purpose consistent. And then the third one, exercise self-compassion. Be compassionate to yourself. Be compassionate to others, because if you can't be compassionate to others, you can't be compassionate to yourself. Um, so those are our three guiding principles for this episode. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening today and we hope you enjoyed and got something out of this podcast episode today and if you did we would really appreciate it if you could go on to um, the ratings or review page of whichever podcast service you use and leave hopefully a favorable rating and uh, a pleasant review about the alpha mind podcast we do enjoy bringing these to you we get a lot of pleasure from it um, we hope you get something out of it. Um, if you want to know more about us and our service, do look us up on alpha-mind.net. You can also go onto our blog page, alphamindblog.blogspot.com. You'll find articles, past articles, links to past podcast episodes. Um, you'll also see connections to pages where you can get a discount on the STA home study course. And again, thank you to our podcast sponsor, the Society of Technical Analysts, the STA. You can also find a discount code for the uh, Traders Mind Journal on there, which is uh, a product we spoke about on our uh, podcast a few weeks ago. Please also do feel free to connect to us. If you're interested in our services, in our coaching services, in our coaching programs, you can look up more details about those also on the blog page um, or contact us info at alpha-mind.net um, and we can tell you more about them. Or do contact myself or Mark directly on Twitter my handle is at alphamind101. Mark's handle is at alphamind102. Or you can connect with us and contact us through LinkedIn. Again, if you're interested to know more about our work. As a reminder, we work with individual traders, um, both on the sell side and the buy side. We work with retail traders, um, investment bank traders, energy firm traders, traders in hedge funds and asset management firms. We also work with people connected to the trading world. We are executive coaches. So we work with leaders and managers and teams within businesses, helping to make the businesses more effective and more productive. One last thing, we do have a newsletter um, and there's good information about us. Always a useful article on there, links to previous episodes. So you, you can subscribe for that also on the Alpha Mind blog page. Finally, that just leaves us to say thank you once again. And we wish you the very best of luck in the markets. Bye.